Hey, you guys want to know a great place for a one week mountain biking vacation? The Czech Republic. You know what else is happening in the Czech Republic? Prusa and Prusa Research. If you've been following the 3D printing news lately, you'll know they've basically launched a Thingiverse alternative where you can upload and share your files. They've got a bunch of awesome community designers on board that publish their designs on Prusa printers. It's also a people finder where you can find other users on a map that also have a Prusa machine. And that feature was originally met with a bit of suspicion because it puts any Prusa printer ever sold on a map, even if you haven't registered it. It used to show addresses a bit too accurately, uh, but now has more randomization applied. But one really interesting thing that you can do on the model sharing side is that you can not only upload STLs for people to slice themselves, you can also upload 3MF files that Prusa Slicer 2.0, the successor of Slick Throw Prusa Edition, can read and those contain both the 3D model and the slicer settings, but anyone can also upload an already sliced G-code file. And that's not something you'd usually do. Also, let me know if you'd like to see some videos on Prusa Slicer 2.0, but as you know, a G-code file is essentially the equivalent of an executable file on a computer. It's commands that the machine blindly executes. A 3D printer has absolutely no clue about what it's printing. It's just following a bunch of commands line after line. No matter what, it doesn't stop for anything, even if it destroys itself. So today, we're going to look into what I did to this poor Prusa Mark III with G-code I downloaded from prusaprintus.org. I mean, it's G-code that I uploaded myself with the intention of demonstrating what's possible, but it wouldn't be necessarily have to be me. It could be someone else with less good intention sneaking things into the G-code you're printing. You get the idea. Let's get moving. So, how did I go about this? First, I needed a Prusa Printers account, one that wasn't necessarily linked to my name since the folks at Prusa make it suspicious there, so obviously I went for Baphomet, added a fitting photo, and there we go, there's the totally non-suspicious looking Prusa Printer user. Yeah. Usually a G-code file straight out of a slicer won't damage your machine, uh, at least not intentionally. But it's also only using a super small part of the G-code feature set, so if you ever wonder what other features there are, the RepRap wiki actually has a fantastic page that gives you details on every single G-code command that's supported by every type of firmware. So naturally, I went through and picked some that looked interesting. I think we can divide the different G-codes into two sets. Those that are destructive in the moment, like ramming the hot in somewhere it's not supposed to be, and those that change the functionality of the printer permanently, like setting the top speed super slow, or detuning the hotend's thermal control. But for those, we need one simple command to work, and that is M500. M500 stores the currently loaded settings into EEPROM. So instead of forgetting all the things we changed the next time we turn the printer's power off and on, we'd have those settings stored in the non-volatile EEPROM and would now instead load those settings back every time the printer is turned on. And because there's no factory reset feature, it's actually rather hard to get rid of bad settings overrides or even diagnose them if you don't know exactly what's going on. But I didn't know yet whether M500 would work when printing from an SD card, so I created a simple fake G-code file and tried it out. The printer should first do a bunch of fast moves, then lower its maximum speed, do the same moves at full speed again, which is now a crawl, and then save those new top speeds permanently. So, Here's the G-code on an SD card. There is so much stuff on this card. There's the home. Is that it? All right, let's try this again. I think what was happening here is because of the way these printers work, sometimes G-codes that are further down in the file actually get processed as soon as they hit the buffer while the printer is still like running up here, but commands that are further down are already applied as soon as they get written to the buffer. So yeah, let's try this again. Doesn't look like it's moving. But yeah, it is, it is actually moving, it is totally slow, so that must mean that the G-code worked. <laughs> so just to show what that was supposed to look like, here's the fixed G-code again. So first it goes fast, and then it slows down because now the new settings are loaded, and these are permanently stored, as you can see. Ooh. 
That's interesting. Home just stopped working. Because I guess it's going at the wrong speed. This could be even better than I thought. <laughs> so that worked better than expected. Not on the first try, it took me a few iterations, but it does work. Turns out you can actually save printer settings permanently with G-code printed from an SD card. And yeah, this printer is a bit slow now. Uh, that was the first G-code I tried, M203, set maximum feed rate. The way this line works is the M203 command up front, and then the maximum feed rates for X, Y, and Z, and I think Marlin uses millimeters per second, some other firmwares use millimeters per minute here, uh, but you can also use M201 for setting maximum acceleration in millimeters per second squared. Uh, 9807 millimeters per second squared is 1G, the acceleration of gravity. So if you configure your printer to say 10,000 millimeters per second squared, it's actually pulling over 1G in acceleration. That is quite a lot. Uh, the last one that is interesting because you can save its settings is M304, set PID parameters. These control how the printer heats the hardened and heated bed and how it tries to maintain temperature. Explaining PID is a bit too much now, but the G-code line works as M304, P something, I something, and D something, and just directly sets the thermal model for the printer. So those all work when you're using an SD card, but can you actually upload files with these G-codes to push your printer so that you'd mess up other people's printers? No, no, you can't. Uh, first of all, M500 is blocked, so there go any chances of permanently storing those settings in someone's printer. M201, to set maximum acceleration, is actually used by the slicer to change acceleration between, for example, perimeters and infill, uh, so that's not being blocked. M203 itself is also allowed, but again, if you don't have M500 to permanently store anything, all those changes are going to be gone the next time the printer is turned off. So that's not going to work. How about some other G-codes that don't need to be stored? I'm thinking maybe we can run a PID tune command with M303 and have the hardened overshoot its safe temperature region. No, blocked. Uh, how about M30, deleting a file on the SD card? Nope. I tried a bunch more of these specialty G-codes, and even the Prusa-specific ones like M509, prompting the user to change uh, a language or to choose the language on the printer's next startup, are blocked. So good job, Prusa, but we're not done here yet. Obviously, our toolset is going to be severely restricted to just the commands that a typical print would use. So if we wanted to cause harm with uploaded G-code, it leaves me with basically moving the printer around in ways that aren't super healthy for the machine. Well, the thing is, some creative printing methods explicitly rely on G-code that is, you know, not quite standard fare. The fuzzy line and droop loop printing is G-code that comes straight out of the slicer, but it's not your traditional stack one layer on top of another kind. So two things come to mind here. First, scratching the build plate and possibly bending or breaking the heat break by shoving the nozzle into the bed. And secondly, just encasing the hot end in a blob of plastic, either by just extruding a whole bunch of filament in one spot, or by melting the nozzle into a finished part. And you can probably not see it from your angle, but the blob definitely did work. So yeah, that's exactly what I did with two specially prepared G-code files. The encased version moves the hot end to the back of the printer and then extrudes one full meter of filament into one spot right above the bed. That should create a proper blob, and it did. Um, but, I mean, if it doesn't, we can just extrude more if it wasn't enough. The scratch G-code moves the hot end to the back, just barely touching the bed, then makes the printer believe it's actually still one millimeter above the bed, and then tells it to move to zero again. And effectively, this makes it shove the nozzle one millimeter below the bed surface, and in later iterations, I actually did more than just a millimeter. And both of these types of G-code exploits uploaded to Prusa printers without any issues. But before we can test this, we still need to fix a bit of a problem because this printer is still speed limited by what we did just a second ago. So if I try to move it, that's all it's gonna do. So there's a really simple fix for that. It's just two lines of G-code. Let me show you those right now. So all you need to do is connect to the printer with a tool like Prontoface, then send it an M502. 502. This resets all the printer's settings to default. And there we go, hard-coded default settings loaded. And now we can already move it around faster 
but to make these settings permanent we send it an m500 and now it's setting stored so now we have a basically bone stock prusa i3 mark iii again let's load some filament So yeah, I did cut out the entire Benchy print part out of this G-code just to speed up the process, but the, the payload in this G-code is exactly the same as in the full Benchy print. So let's see, we're moving to the back, moving up. What was that? Take two. I'm back. Take three. Here we go. So yeah, that works. That can be exploited on Prusa printers. So here's the actual blobbing part of that G-code, sped up, of course, a bit. And it does create a rather large blob. And of course you can just keep going if the user doesn't stop the print there. Next up, let's try if we can scratch the bed. Okay, so it is dragging along, but so far it's not looking like it's damaging anything. Let's try that again and go a bit lower this time. Yeah, you can see where it kind of scraped off the dust, but not a whole lot more than that. Okay, this one's a bit deeper. Oh yeah, you can definitely see how the how the bed bent down there. Okay, I've got one more that is even deeper. Oh, this one actually crash detected. Okay, but overall the bed doesn't look damaged at all. So that was all done with a cold nozzle and there are a few spots on here where the bed, this is not the, the coated bed, this is the, the PI sticker type, um, where the bed already has some blemishes. And yeah, I guess one last thing to try here is whether we can actually burn into this PI film by setting the hot into, I don't know, 260, 270, I don't know how hot this goes, but yeah, we should do a bit more damage here. Ooh, 295. Good, 122. Okay, let's set this to full blast. Of course, I'm doing this through the LCD menu right here, but you can just as easily use two lines of G-code to set these temperatures that of course are also going to upload to Prusa printers. 295 degrees with PLA loaded. That doesn't actually look all too bad. Hey, let's try this. Heat it up at 122 degrees on the bed and the hotter is currently heating back up to 295. Okay, here we go. Two millimeters down, crash detected. Ah, come on. Okay, one more try, just 1.5 millimeters below the bed surface this time. I guess if you would move more slowly down towards C, so if you go at an angle, it may not get detected by crash detection. But yeah, so far, even this is... Oh yeah, I mean, there's a burn hole right there. Yeah, we could burn holes into this heated bed. Um, scratching it and bending the heat break is gonna be harder than I thought, but there's definitely a hole there right now. Let me show you. Right there. That's new. So, I guess if we heat up this far, we could basically um, fill most of the bed with just burn marks, so especially the center where you're going to be printing the most. Ouch. Yeah, that, that one, that one hurts. Um, let me show you real quick what I did to get that first blobbing G-code to run. Uh, the problem was that single line of G1, E1000, F1000 that was intended to move that one meter of filament in one go. Um, but the Marlin firmware actually has a protection feature built in that prevents long extrude moves like this. By default, it's something like you can't extrude more filament length um, than your longest printer axis at a time. So for the Prusa, it would be like 25 or 30 centimeters, give or take, for a single extrude move. But like we just saw, there's nothing stopping me from doing a bunch of short moves in a row with the same effect on creating a massive blob on the printer's nozzle. I stopped this one because I, I, didn't, I didn't actually want to ruin my printer, but you could, you could just keep on going there. So in conclusion, are Prusa doing a good job of scanning the G-code uploaded to prusaprinters.org? I don't think so. They are blocking a lot of G-codes outright that could be used with harmful intent. Most importantly, M500 saves settings to EEPROM. But 
as we saw with the bed scratching and the blobbing exploits, there's still a bunch of routes how even this already limited G-code could end up damaging your printer. Especially if you're not paying attention to your printer working, especially if you're not babysitting it, because it could be at any point in the G-code file. What Prusa printers are doing is like an antivirus that catches 98% of all viruses. Well, it's gonna be those 2% that don't get caught uh, that will actually end up being successful. Prusa has taken care of the low-hanging fruit here. Um, the scratching issue could be solved by disallowing G92, which manipulates how the printer internally keeps track of its position, as well as enforcing software end stops so the printer would never move below its zero height. But keeping the printer from intentionally creating blobs or crashing the hot end into a print is a bit harder. For the latter one, you'd probably want to ensure that the printhead only ever moves upwards during a print, but that would limit some print modes like sequential printing, where one object is printed after the next sequentially. Um, for stopping blobs, well, you'd probably need a pretty complex simulation. Make sure that like for every section or voxel of the print envelope, the printer doesn't extrude more filament than what actually fits into that area that it's moving through. But yeah, I don't, I don't know, that sounds pretty involved. And the thing is, this isn't something that is limited to prusaprinters.org. This is something that is just an intrinsic issue or, or property with G-Code itself. I definitely wouldn't run random G-Code files from the internet in the first place, no matter where I cut them from, unless it's someone I personally trust. As much as people try to make G-Code shareable and even try to make it a universal language between different machines, I just don't think it's the right format to share print files with. 3MF, combining the 3D model and a suggested set of print settings sounds like it makes a whole lot more sense. But then again, it may open up a whole nother Pandora's box of fishy print settings. Let me know in the comments below if you have any more nefarious ideas of how to craft, well, questionable G-code. And just a disclaimer here, everything I showed in this video is public knowledge. You can Google everything I showed you today. Please don't be a dick and use this information to actually cause harm to someone or someone's machines. That's just unnecessary. And if you're on the other side and thinking about printing that G-code you found on the internet somewhere, just don't. Uh, Prusa Printers is pre-filtering them, but stuff found elsewhere is not and can contain all sorts of stuff. Thanks to my patrons for making content like this possible. Special shout out to my patrons in the shout out tier this month, which are Andy Fair, Brian Raker, Christopher Day, Dexter Gillette, Thorian Gray, Phyllis Truder, Francisco Peebles, James C. Foley, Jeffrey Nicoletic, Jimmy Lee, Jonathan Marlin, Marcus Harms, Matthew Oswald, Mike McGee, Nathan Haste, Olivares, Paul Arden, Robert Hornberg, Rudolf Wang, and William Devine. Thank you guys so much. If you want to join in as well, you can do that right here. Uh, I'm now going to ask you to do the usual things, like, share, subscribe, and click that bell. And yeah, thank you for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.